We're going to talk about Chrysler's program book controller interface. It's a J1850 specification, and it is, is used by other vehicles as well. In this particular case, it's used up until about 2002, where Chrysler started changing over to CAN. It is good news here. It stays on pin 2. It's pulse width modulated. Uh, it's a protocol used for two-way communications between a group of electronic modules, ECUs, electronic control units, whatever you want to call them. But remember something. All of these modules talk all the time, and they don't need a scan tool hooked up. It's a single wire communications that allows everybody to talk at any time, and it's going to have to use transmission verification and some very good priority sharing so that nobody tries to talk and have collisions. It's a 1.2 kilobaud in this particular star configuration. The star configuration is where all the modules are connected to the bus at one central point. Now, actually, we have three central points here, three different splices. It goes from the PCI to all of these others. This is the bus that security key immobilizer is going to use to notify the PCM that it has the correct security code and the engine can be allowed to start. Now, but an open and just one wire going to one particular module won't affect the whole bus. For instance, this one wire broke down here at the instrument cluster. We would lose communication with the instrument cluster. In a case like that, we would probably get a U code indicating we've lost communications with the instrument cluster. Now that's important because this is a fundamental thing we'll be doing. Short on that bus, because it's a star connector, shuts everybody down. Nobody has a signal anymore. It's every one of these lines are stuck at ground. Now let's go have a look at that signal, see what it looks like. This is called our decision point. I want to point out to you it's about halfway up. Now we're going to go from here and look at this run live so you can see exactly what this looks like. We're trying to make sure you understand their data burst taking place here, that this is not a continuous transmission. That's why we take the time in each one of these protocols to make sure you have the opportunity to look at a video recording of an live lab scope pattern so you can get a feel for it. And we'll go and stop it and do some more discussion and talk about it and talk about diagnostics, but now you should have a feel for what we're going to be looking at. Well, you got a chance to see how the pattern moves around. It's not a steady screen like this. And you see what communications looks like. And we feel that's an important thing for you to understand because it helps you recognize how things are going to look. But let's see how this data gets on the screen. Every one of these modules has a PCI driver like this. We talked about it in the introduction to scan tool or to communications. We look out here, we see a variable pulse width signal as we're looking at down there like you saw in the movie. Inside of here, the signal is created in the transmit side of the transceiver. Transceiver is a combination transmitter receiver. That's why it lives in single communications, single box. And there's a, a this pattern that's developed by this transceiver is developed across a termination resistor and we have different values. Dominant nodes can take control of it. They have low values. Standard modes which will relinquish control to a dominant node has a higher resistance. Uh, if any module, any time can talk, so there has to be a set priority and we'll talk a little bit about priority because you need to understand that to understand how we avoid data collisions. The idle in this particular case, when there's no communication, also known as the recessive state, is zero volts. You're looking at the zero volt state right here. It's recessive. For a module to talk, it must find a recessive state. As you see, one module's been talking, it quits and gets quiet. The next module says, boom, I'm ready to talk. 
Remember, this is happening 10,000 times a second. It's very fast. Now, once a module wants to talk, its first action is to go dominant. In that particular case, we're going to go up to 7, 7.5 volts. When we go high, that tells all other modules to be quiet and to listen. Right here, we have the same signal on all of these. This group of modules with the engine transmissions, it's all on one. So let's go back and look at this again. Remember, we said the skim must talk with the PCM to tell it. And that, that's security key immobilizer module, meaning if it doesn't have the right code, it won't let it start. And a no start result if they can't communicate. So this is very important. In another example, the IPC doesn't show vehicle speed. You say, oh, what's going on here? You have to wonder what's happened if I can't see vehicle speed. Well, the IPC receives VSS from the ABS module. So what we do, what we find out here is we check around. We can't communicate with the ABS module. We have a U code. If you've got a U code on the ABS module and it can't communicate, what would you do? This is where most of the standard diagnostics fall down on you because they don't give you a good reading on that. The question we have for you and the way we're going to diagnose a complex system with a lot of modules like this is, ask, is answer a diagnostic question. Does the ABS module receive the PCI signal? Decision point. Is it there? Do we have a clean signal? Is it in the middle? If the signal reaches the ABS module, that means the wiring is good. It's on the bus. Now we go test the ABS module. Does it have good power, good ground? Is it really making contact? Yeah, this is not a one-hour diagnostic. We keep reminding you of that. Sometimes to find problems in wiring and stuff, you're going to tear this apart. When any one module is replaced, check to see if it requires programming you may need to program these modules if you replace them and don't use one from a junkyard because if it has the wrong code you're going to be messed up if it needs programming program it before you continue because replacing a module without programming is going to create new problems now not all these modules are going to require it but make sure you know what you've got you can find a bad module by pinging getting status by logical deduction and diagnostics, any one of the three. If you're working on a system where you can get a status report, then go do it, get that report, and verify it and find it. A total bus failure is a different process. That means we can't ping, we can't get a status, we can't communicate, and we're not going to see a U code. So this is a worst case scenario. So we start here in this dead bus. Uh, we go to pin two and we start looking. Do we have the signal there? Tells us some things. If it's pulled to ground, we got something wrong. We're going to have to go find out what. We go in here, hook up to a chassis ground, put our lead in 10 2. We got a signal. Now, well, there's something wrong. We have lots of communication, so that's normal. Less communications means nothing. It just means there's not as many people talking. Don't get excited. Let's get into the diagnosis. Remember, we showed you the movie so that you'd know there are times of lots of communications, less communications. Now let's get down to looking at how we diagnose with it. Here's a good on the left, bad on the right. If we got something like the right, not a single module is going to be able to communicate. They're all going to shut down. Any module can cause a total bus failure. All it has to do is to pull the module low and keep it low. Short out so that it can't change. Now, a bad module can hang it high just as well as low. It can be either way. Broken shorted wires. Sometimes, particularly after an accident, you will find shorted wires. That's why it's labor intensive. Plan on charging by the hour. Splices in module locations make it difficult to go isolate every one of these modules. So, But you're going to have to do it. We can't give you a shortcut. There's no easy way to fix this. Some star configurations, 
do have something that's very important. It's called a joint connector. It's where all of them come to a central point. What happens at a joint connector? Is this all these splice wires come to one spot and we can go in and separate them out and go look at them. We disconnect it. Let's see what it looks like. We go under the hood. Most times it's on Chrysler. It's in the power distribution box. This is it, the white piece. We're going to take it out. There's two of them here. We're going to remove them. And there's this is another version. There's one on each side. You have to know where they are, find a good location. Here it is removed. This is a jumper bar. It hooks all of these wires together. When we pull this out, none of these wires can be hooked together. All those individual pins on both sides are going to be open. They're not hooked to anything else. That gives us a great opportunity. We can now come in and go one at a time through each one of these with our schematic so we know what we're looking at and we can isolate which one. We have communications there. This is not the circuit or the module that's hanging the circuit low or high. Let's say that one more time. We've isolated all the modules. We're lucky because they don't keep these forever. They go away, unfortunately. I hate to tell you that, but I wish I could tell you something better. But the damn things go away, and they were so good to have when we had them. We go one at a time, and we go in here and say, okay, on this particular node, we have communications. This module is trying to talk. We go down to the next one. It's trying to talk. We're in good shape. We go to the next one, and bah, you see we change scopes. Here's our bad one. This is the wire or the module that's pulling the, the circuit down and causing all the communications to shut down. In this particular vehicle, when we shut down communications, we have a no-start problem. So we come back here and we look to see exactly how those modules are wired up and which one they go to. When the module is isolated at the junction connector, the problem is either in the wire or the module. Next, you would verify the wiring and the module's condition. Is the wiring bad? If not, we found the problem. And that concludes PCI. We've got it down to a module. We've used the signal to get us there. You've seen bad. Remember, it is the module that is going to have all the communications all the time. You don't have to have your scan tool hooked up. If you need to review anything, go back. Use the space bar to pause the video so you can look at a particular thing and go do that step and understand this before you go and try to diagnose it. If you don't understand something, go back and review it until you do. That's the beauty of interactive video.